Hello everyone, this is Supreme Decisions, and today is the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. I haven't been on here for a while, but hope you guys are forgiving me on that. But what I want to talk about today is due process. Due process is something that we are expecting to receive whenever we are, whenever we become involved with the legal system. Now, What I want to talk about today in the context of due process is going to be the standards and how they may may be lowered in the presence of overwhelming video and photography evidence and guilt. Because one of the things that we're often seeing now is the fact that people have more ready access to good quality video when they are having an interaction with the police. And... We know more than 76% of video does not come from police whenever we're talking about court interactions. Now, in this context, we're going to talk about or debate about the constitutionality of due process protections when it comes to these videos, because I'm not sure how old you are as you're listening to this, but I'm from an era where we watched 12 police officers beat Rodney King to oblivion and the public say, eh, it was okay. And then later say, okay, he's going to be awarded X amount of millions of dollars because it wasn't right. While these police officers remained policing these same citizens. So we look at a video I did because again, um, it was sent to me by a young man who was involved. And a lot of times people say, well, why didn't he just comply? Why didn't he just do this? Why didn't he just do that? Or this police officer was really nice, so it should have been okay. Well, he officer, and the officer was um, Blake Simmons of the Frisco Police Department here in Texas. And what happened was Blake Simmons, although nice, immediately when a supervisor came on the scene, as was asked, Blake Simmons began to lie and create a narrative. This nice police officer lied and created a narrative on video. While the case was dismissed, at the same time, the federal case is stalled. Why? Because this nice officer is now not really seeing violating law, even though he performed a search without consent. He performed a search and took away things out of a place that was secured without a warrant. He did this without probable cause. So in context, he did this without following his own oath and law, the law he is upholding. But he was a nice guy. But even with the video, it's difficult to prosecute. Why? Because piranha don't eat piranha. But again, the due process standards in these protections have to be exercised in a manner that generally is not fast. And what they're doing as a prosecutorial tactic, in this case, a defensive tactic, is using timelines to extend these punishments or prolong the availability of punishment to see if you are way able to withstand the longevity of these actions. Now, in Title IX is a federal statute that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in any educational programs or activities that receive federal funding. Now, this is one of the things that was really big in California. I want to say in 2012, And what happens is it now starts to leak into other aspects of it. But even in that, I'm going to go, I'm 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 going somewhere with this, so just stay with me. In Doe v. Ohio State University, federal and state governments may not deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, procedural due process requires 
that a person subjected to deprivation by the government receive notice and an opportunity to be heard, both of which been defined in detail by the Supreme Court. And we know this because the Supreme Court exhibits the law of the land. And even Matthews v. Eldridge discusses the requirements of constitutionality, sufficient opportunity to be heard. And in Mullane v. Central Hanover Bank and Trust, and it discusses the requirements of constitutionality of sufficient notice. Because remember, due process requires notice and an opportunity to be heard. And it's been done in detail by the Supreme Court. Matthews v. Eldridge, Mullane v. Central Hanover Bank and Trust. Now, when we're talking about the ideas constitutionally acceptable because visual evidence established the guilt of the accused photos and videos are objectively depict guilt in court in its due process analysts basically what we're always told is a picture is worth a thousand words a video speaks for itself but again Perception is king because the ideals that one has actually allows for bias to sleep in, allows for prejudice to seep in, and it allows us to shape these ideals, these videos, these pictures, and these words into scopes of our own experiences, our own interactions, our own depictions of what they should and are telling us. And this is why when we're talking about the constitutionality of it, it becomes something because our environment shape our thoughts. It shapes our being and it shapes our perception, which generally means when we're looking at something, it doesn't mean that we all see it in the exact same way. Because apply a preponderance of evidence standard to video. When courts apply this standard, it actually goes into a deeper idea of who sees what and how. And that's why whenever you're talking about this, I speak about how the prosecutor has to go into this thing of intent. A picture very seldom actually shows intent. A video can show a stage of intent depending on who is being shown to. I'm going to say that one more time. A picture has an opportunity to show you intent. A video shows intent depending on who you are showing it to. Because even when we talk about the, the complexity of perception, even showing a video, such as the Rodney King video, such as the Blake, um, Blake Simmons video, it clearly shows the defendant violated the constitutional due, um, due process rights under 42, 1983. However, the courts are slow to judge those who they deem is infallible. Because I often talk about the thing where we often tell people, well, you should just comply. Why is nobody ever asking the officer to do the job properly? Yes, I pause for a dramatic effect because I want you to understand what it is that I'm giving you. I want you to understand that because when we're talking in the context of this, I'm showing you something because right then I just, I just dropped something on you that many of you that probably just started listening to me have never heard because the reason it's foreign 
God, excuse me. The reason it's foreign is because it's never or rarely asked. Because even when we're talking about this, that seemed cringy. It seemed out of the norm. It seemed in a manner in which you perceive it to be. Yes, again, pause for dramatic effect because I want you to think about it. Because in section 1983, it creates a private right of action for individuals who are deprived of any rights, privileges, or immunities protected by the Constitution of the United States or federal law by any person acting under the color of state law. So whenever Blake Simmons decided to not get consent, not decided to ignore not having probable cause because an expired registration does not require a search. Because what are you searching for? The re registration? He made a decision to act outside of any law. He made a decision to act outside of his oath. When these police officers decided to use excessive force, they made a decision to act outside the scope of restraining someone. They made a decision to act outside the scope of the procedures that they were taught to restrain someone, to de-escalate, to maintain professionalism. All of these things, because even the, the police officers in Dallas that I showed you, where they have, we have a law here, in, well, hell, it's a law everywhere. I believe it's called Emily's Law. Where if someone has a medical condition and you have a facility, guess what? You have to allow them to use that facility if you are open. They laughed at a man because he was refused service and they refused to do their job. This was in direct violation of their oath. This was in direct violation of their own standards of professionalism. This was also in violation of their department policy. But what happened whenever their chief got on the news to give a press conference? Their supervisors got on the news. Give, all of them said, oh, no, they, wouldn't, they didn't break any laws. They didn't violate any policy. When I read to you the law they broke, when I read to you the policy, the, the department policy that they violated. Because what you have to understand is, even in that video, it displayed all of these officers. Two, which didn't have body cams on, which was a violation of Texas um, code for them, which was the violation of their department policy. Remember, they didn't violate it. There was a video, two of them not having their body cameras on. There was an officer that asked why their body cameras wasn't on, yet they didn't break any law. They didn't violate any policy, yet both of those are things that broke a law that violated the policy. But the perception, they wanted you to believe that these officers were in the right. And then when these officers were punished, they still didn't give you their names. Why is that? Don't worry about it. I'll let you catch on to that. I'm going to go into Matthews v. Eldris, and this is the test that they were speaking of. One, is the private interest affected by government action? Absolutely. Two, the risk of erroneous deprivation of that interest through the applica applicable procedures and the probable value of further procedural safeguards. Now, when we were talking about Blake Simmons, I gave you that exact same thing. He did this. One of his officers, I believe it was Officer Johnson, yelled, he does this all the time. So that means... There's a risk of erroneous deprivation of that interest through applicable procedures. Why? Because he made a conscious decision. Because you understand, officers have free will. Because it's the officer discretion to do the things. So how did he violate his oath? He made a willful action because of his discretion to violate, see how those all tied together? 
to violate a private interest by going into someone's conveyance without consent, without a warrant, without probable cause, to retrieve things from a locked area, not from plain view, from a locked area. He then opened another locked. Uh oh, see see how we're we're talking about. But this officer was nice. He was nice. So what, what, what's the problem? He was nice. We can't do anything with the niceness. He did all this being nice. He lied while he was nice. But now, number three, the government's interest, including the burdens that further procedural requirements would entail. He was supposed to be trained properly. He has one of the longest trainings in the country, which is 11 and a half months. It's literally almost a full year of training and he still got it wrong. Why? Because he made a choice. He exercised officer discretion. Now, multiple meaningful opportunities to challenge the university's allegations, evidence, and findings provided to the students, further procedural safeguards would not have changed the outcome of this case. Well, the safeguard of the Blake Simmons case, the opportunity to challenge it in federal court is the fact that his training, his discretion, these are things that are already in place. These are the safeguards that he ignored so the opportunity to challenge is his discretion because he gave it to you. Because he doesn't have the right to violate on a whim, even though he does this all the time. So he's making his choice all the time. And even Kerry V. Pissless, P-I-P-H-U-S. The right to procedural due process is absolute. I'm going to say that one more time. The right to procedural due process is absolute. Always understand that. The right to challenge. The right to be heard. The right to confront your accuser is absolute. And many of us miss that. Because 95% of cases never go to a judge. Never go before a jury. 95% of cases. There are over 2 million cases a month. Over 2 million per month. 95% of them never go before a judge. Let that sink in. That's our system. That's the programming that has been set upon us right now. Not to fight back, not to go in, not to do anything, not to defend, not to exercise the procedural due process right of absolution. And the right to remain innocent. Yes, I actually stopped and paused for dramatic effect. But first, conceived to address the due process claim arising in the context of administrative law. And this is Medina v. California in 1992. A general approach for testing challenge state procedures under due process claim are done through courts and being heard. Because it starts with the simple thing of that motion to challenge. It literally starts with the actual action of challenging. Further procedural safeguards would not have lessened the risk of er erroneous deprivation of rights in interest or otherwise alter the outcome. And generally, those are the things that are set upon when you're dealing with a prosecution. They're going to say, oh, well, the safeguards would not have changed this. If the safeguards doesn't change it, that means this is an allowed practice. Always understand it's the verbiage 
Pay attention because listening is a skill. You have one mouth and two ears, so you should listen twice as much as you speak because that's how you find out what's actually being said. That's how you actually become heard because now you can actually respond if you're listening to hear versus listening to just respond. You can respond with intellect and in most cases, you can respond with the proper challenge and you can allow them to actually dig their own grave because if you give them enough rope, they'll give you everything you want. I'm gonna say that once, if you give them enough rope, they'll give you everything you want because at the end of the day, most of them have no idea that they're violating law because they've been doing it so long and 95% of the cases they have never go challenged. Due process is never challenged. Due process is never exercised 95% of the time. That means out of 100, 95 of them are not. They have five that challenge and then guess what? They're challenged with people that's on their team. Generally, it's done with public pretenders. Unless you're paying an outside shooter. Now, again, we're still going to stay on the video. Remember, one of the things I'm telling you is subconscious biases affect viewers' perceptions of photos and videos. Data demonstrate that human perception of video imagery is often subject to various cognitive biases and distortions because I can't see beyond my own experience. I can't see beyond my own life. Scott v. Harris, the Supreme Court determined that video evidence of a car chase provided by the dash camera of the policeman Scott's cruiser is utterly discredited that no reasonable jury could have believed him. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say, the video from a dash cam of a car chase was utterly discredit, discredited that no reasonable jury could believe him. Even with the video, they said that we still can't believe you. Recognizing that the existence of undisputed video evidence justified summary judgment. Mostly, I'm a, a undisputed. That means the video itself was not challenged. These are things that are direct evidence of misconduct. It wasn't challenged. So it allowed for a summary judgment because it was not challenged. Due process in this case was not exercised, even in, even in the context of actually seeing what had happened. Because evidence portrays an objective truth. Countless subconscious factors shape people's perception of visuals, depiction of alleged crimes. These are videos that we watch on TikTok that I would call the Karen videos. I watched one the other day and this old man, and I mean old man because he, he was an older gentleman. He had fully white hair and wrinkled skin and all that good stuff and he broke this young man's pole, fishing pole, because he was he was trespassing. While it was a visual depiction of an alleged crime, it was an actual undisputed visual evidence of a crime. Because the destruction of property above a hundred dollars is a crime. It is a crime in every sense of the word because you're breaking something that doesn't belong to you. 
You're destroying something that doesn't belong to you. And for whatever reason, you feel you have the right to someone else's property. But there were no charges pressed. There were no other actions, even though there was video evidence that was undisputed of an actual crime. Because even the young man said, that's assault on a minor. Video evidence of an actual crime. Yet there were no charges filed. Perception bases base the bias that each one of us see when we're watching that. Because the letter of the law doesn't care either way. It's the exercise of the due process of even challenging those that are what you've seen. The pernicious influence of cognitive imperfections in the courtroom have things such as demographic factors, including race, gender, and in age, influence viewers' perception of video depictions of alleged crimes because again one's perception is their reality because if you have someone that's never been anywhere they're going to tell you how it is everywhere because all they know is what's in front of them i'm going to say that you'll have someone that has been nowhere they'll tell you how it is everywhere because their perception of reality doesn't go beyond their front yard. Accused members of minority populations long stereotype as sexually dangerous may be particularly vulnerable to judges' perception and perceiving their actions as criminal because explicit bias shaping perceptions of credibility may lead judges to interpret a recorded encounter to be less criminal based on the demographics of the alleged victims. Now, I'm gonna give you an example because I'm getting ready to close out on this one. This wasn't a long one today. But I watch uh, on occasion the Fresh and Fit podcast. Now, what I enjoyed was the fact that they played a video. This young lady is screaming and she's yelling, she's throwing stuff and she's at the airport. Everybody ran over to the man she was screaming at, asking him what was wrong with her. She's sitting right beside him. No one asked her a thing. And Myron on from Fresh and Fit asked a question that was, it was profound. It was prolifically profound in my TI. He asked if the man was yelling and screaming and throwing stuff at her, would there be a different response? Everyone on the panel that he asked immediately said, absolutely, yes. Because the accused member long stereotyped as dangerous, which is being male, a toxic male, a male asserting himself is considered dangerous there will be a different response versus, and as they put it, an equal female doing the exact same thing. Because he, in all cases, is perceived to be dangerous and part of a criminal element. Many of us don't look at it that way until we sit down and we actually get that situation and we pose it. We have an opportunity to think because our own biases, our own experiences, our own race and gender shape how we see things. Because many of us would have said, you know what, maybe she was having a bad day. A man doesn't have that opportunity to have a bad day. because of the perceived bias. It's 
And most of it is subconsciously ingrained, even if the action is the exact same. Always think about that. It might be something as simple as that, but always understand that is in the back of everyone's mind. Photo and video evidence appears in courtroom with increasing frequency. Why? Because of social media. And video recording has become ubiquitous in American culture. Why? Because the majority of Americans now have ready access to quality video and filming equipment, such as camera phones. It's even going down to those as young as two and three years old. And only 20% of video that we're watching or photos that appear in court actually come from police officers. I want you to let that sink in. And that's why they don't want you filming them. Because they know they are not following the rules. They know they can't follow their own rules and guidelines. And they also know that they are perceived as good guys as long as they have on that uniform. So always understand, even with video, perception rules the world. And innate biases is going to be a challenge when you are challenging everything in court. This is Supreme Decisions. I love you guys. Keep supporting the podcast. Support the channel because I'm going to start putting up some new stuff. And don't forget, I got a new podcast coming out called This Is My Two Cents where I'm going to give you guys opinions and statements about pretty much everything. So, Supreme Decision, and I'm out.